So first of all, we are recording this. I will edit out all that snafu stuff in the beginning before I post the recording to our website. So it'll be pretty and it'll be like nothing ever happened. Um, but my name is Jenna Nilo. I am the Director of Marketing and Outreach with Illinois Digital Educators Alliance. So thank you to everybody who's here today. Um, we are going, we've, we're welcoming some folks from CDWG, Jennifer, Diana, and Dave, and in a minute, I'm going to turn things over to them, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves with all of their bio and all their good stuff, um, but thank you to CDWG for this um, opportunity today to learn about um, SAMR, so from substitution to redefinition, elevating student learning online. Um, this is one of my, um, my close to my heart uh, topics in ed tech. So I'm, I'm so excited to learn along with all of you today. A few quick housekeeping items is um, if you could just do me a favor, keep yourself muted and uh, keep your video off. That way, Jennifer, Diana, and Dave will have the spotlight. I'm gonna kill myself in a second here and then you won't have to look at me and um, you won't hear my dog barking in the background when the UPS guy comes to the door. So um, I will stay quiet as well. Um, and as I said, we are recording this. So tomorrow I will go ahead and um, email everybody who registered for the webinar today, a recording of the webinar, the slide deck, and then any other resources that CDWG um, wants to share out with you guys. But look for that email to come to you tomorrow in the um, email that you use to register for this session. And then also um, we'll post this, this on our website. So it will be on our Wednesday webinar page of our website. So you'll be able to go back and review, share it with colleagues, um, people who couldn't join today. So definitely um, please share the wealth of knowledge that you're gonna get here today. And finally, um, Illinois educators, if you're looking for um, your PDH or anybody else who's per perchance out of state, if you're looking for a completion certificate to just show that you were here and then be able to turn that in for professional development credit, at the end of session, um, because it, it does require live attendance, at the end of the session, I'm go gonna go ahead and post a link into the chat window. And then that way um, you guys will be able to click on that link, fill out some stuff and get your um, completion certificate, your credit. So without further ado, I am going to turn things over to our folks from CDWG. So I'm going to turn myself off. Thank you so much for being here today, guys, and I'm excited to learn. Thanks. Thank you. We're so excited to be here. We'll jump and just fly quickly through our bio slide. We don't need to get super deep into it. Um, Dave, if you want to advance, beautiful. So we'll go in alphabetical order. I'm going to throw it over to Dave to give his introduction. So good morning, everybody. I'm Dave Andrade. I'm a senior education strategist with CDWG. I cover the Northeast, so New England, New York, and New Jersey, um, outside of New York City, which Diana covers. Um, and our team works with schools on their ed tech projects and plans and really helping them to integrate technology, find best practices. Uh, my background is engineer, high school physics teacher, ed tech specialist, and then CIO for my school district in Connecticut. And I'm Diana Gross. As David said, I serve New York City. Um, my background is domestic and international education and directing learning and innovation for uh, K through 12. Jen? Awesome. I'm Jennifer Brown. I'm a former um, elementary school teacher from Des Plaines District 62. So um, if you're from Illinois and I'm looking at the chat and it looks like a lot of people here today are from Illinois, you might know that area. In the role that I'm in now, I cover Illinois and a lot of other Midwest states and really the focus is on making sure any educational technology that gets into the classroom is being used in a way that's meaningful and research-based and we just want to make sure teachers and students both feel supported. And so with that, we're going to jump into the outcomes and agenda that we have set for today. We broke it down into really three buckets. And Dave, if you want to jump to the next slide, we can show what that's going to look like. It's going to start off with really laying the framework for the why. We want to talk with you just a little bit about what you can expect for the job skills market. And so we're going to touch on that. Then after that, we're going to get into the technology and pedagogy, pedagogy integration. And that's where we're going to bring in that SAMR framework. Because once we have an idea of the skills that students are going to need to succeed, 
succeed in the workforce across a variety of sectors, we want to make sure we have a solid framework for how we can make sure that good learning is happening in the classroom with technology. And that classroom could be at home or at school. So we're going to touch on that. And finally, we're going to give some suggestions for digital tools that you can use to make sure that you're able to hit some of these fantastic skills we're going to cover today. With that, I'll pass it over to Diana to really kick us off on that fourth industrial revolution and the future of jobs. Great, thanks so much, Jennifer. So um, one of the things that we do here at CDWG is not only are we paying attention closely to what are the tools and what are the updates and everything that's uh, needed right now in a day to day in classrooms across the country, but we also spend quite a bit of time looking 5, 10, 15 years into the future so that we're ensuring that we can best support uh, school districts in being able to prepare students for their futures. So I don't like to read um, for you. So you can go ahead and read that slide. This is from 2016. And if we think about it, some of the uh, skills that we were using just four or five years ago, we didn't have to uh, use, we didn't have to be using those skills, but we're using them now. So Dave's gonna go on to the next. You may have heard about the phrase fourth industrial revolution. And just to give a little bit of context, uh, this is all around technology that's being developed within a society and how that changes how we live and work. So the first industrial revolution was way back uh, in the 1700s, 1800s when steam engines came in. That changed the way we travel, the way we purchased, the way we traded, um, manufactured, all of it. And then um, after that in the 1830s and early 1900s, the assembly line came in and really changed what products we had, what kind of work we were doing. Um, the nine to five hours, all that. In the 19, late 60s, early 70s, computers came along and it began the third industrial revolution. We were changing how we were sharing, communicating, all of that. And quick jumping ahead to now. Um, and the technologies that we are seeing, of course, at the top we see mobile devices, there's cloud computing, and now all of us are working with that through Google Classrooms and this and that augmented reality data. So that changes what type of skills students will need or workforce needs. So let's go to that next slide. Uh, back in 2016, World Economic Forum looked at the top 10 skills. So we're taking a look back to see what did they say and, and are they able to really predict what we are uh, going to be needing. Um, number one, complex problem solving over on the right in 2015 stays as number one type of uh, skill still needed in 2020. And of course, we're doing that constantly these days when we're teaching from home and planning for remote teaching and all that. Um, critical thinking moves up from number four. And then one that really surprised a lot of us, but it's so true, is number 10, creativity pops up to number three. And that's going to be important as we continue to look at what is SAMR, what pedagogy, how are we preparing students, how are we designing lessons and using technology. The other two I don't want to overlook is number six and number 10, emotional intelligence. Um, we hear a lot about that these days and then cognitive flexibility, being able to move back and forth in our thinking. So let's take a look to see if the World Economic Forum on the next slide was accurate. All right, so here's from LinkedIn 2019. Uh, what kind of skills are they looking for? And this goes back to um, cloud computing, artificial intelligence. So indeed, when we're looking at the fourth industrial revolution, that is there, that's being asked of us. Analytical reasoning, um, you know, uh, user design, people manages. So these are the, we are seeing that indeed, these are the job skills that were predicted that are now being uh, top five skills companies are needing. Uh, and then next we're going to look at the jobs. This is uh, came out in 2016 and these are more of those like data analysts that we were just seeing AI skills, machine and learning skills. Um, so the future of job reports was saying that by 2022 we're going to need all this. And you, you may have been looking at it, but we now even in education are looking at data analysis. So um, looking at how we prepare our students for that. Next slide, Dave. And here we see, this is, um, I think these slides kind of flipped out of order, but um, we see number one skill, soft skill needed in 2019 was creativity. 
So as we go through this and we look at what type of tools we are actually using in the classroom, um, let's think about how we're fostering that creative thinking in students. Um, we'll go quickly through this one, but you see the top two physical manual skills. Hiring is way down on that. Uh, basic cognitive skills, way down. But what we do see is this higher cognitive skills of critical thinking, creativity, social, emotional up there. And then the reason a lot of us are here today is those technical skills. All three of those are growing in leaps and bounds for what is needed by for job skills. Uh, and some of you may have heard of it, but this is just a uh, resource for you, the uh, Partnership for 21st Century Learning. We have Critical Thinking, Creativity, Collaborative, Communicate. Um, that link, and you will get a copy of this presentation, the Partnership for 21st Century Thinking has a lot of resources that are supporting schools and students in promoting this type of thinking and um, skills within students. So next we're going to uh, take a look at what type of pedagogy and frameworks um, are we going to put into place that we can leverage the technology we already have um, to support students building those job skills? So Jennifer, you want to take us through some of that uh, pedagogy and, and, and SAMR? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we're going to jump to our next section in that case. And Dave, can you jump one more slide ahead? Let's throw up the Bloom's taxonomy on there. And as I'm looking in the chat, I see that we have a lot of educators here. I'm seeing teacher, 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 and it might be, you know, high school level, K-12 level. But for most of us, this is a framework that we have seen before. And so before I introduce something, a brand new framework, I like to root it in something that a majority of participants you're gonna recognize. And maybe it's been a while since you've had to take a look at this. I know they've changed it before. But one thing that's really gonna resonate, I think, with a lot of us are these different levels of verbs for what it is that we want students actually doing. We have these standards that we're teaching to, but what is it that we're actually having our students do? And so when you look and kind of see that foundational level, yes, there is a need for them to be able to remember certain facts, to recall them, but what we're working towards and what hopefully you were able to take from Diana's section is we're really trying to get our students to create, to think critically. We're trying to differentiate them from a machine because the machines, they're able to do things quickly, accurately, and they don't need to take lunch breaks. So how are we really honing those people, those human skills that our students have, especially in an environment where now they might be in a distance learning situation and we're not used to that. So how are we gonna be encouraging that? If you do jump to the next slide, before I introduce Samer, I wanna do a quick check-in. So I'm gonna ask everybody, you know, if you can jump to the chat for a second and throw in a number for right now where you would rate your current understanding of SAMR on a scale of one to three, just so I can get an idea of where a majority of us are. So maybe you're a one, which is little background knowledge. Maybe you heard it. Maybe you were at a conference and they were throwing it around. Maybe it's a medium. You did a PD on it a couple years ago. You're like, yeah, I kind of remember SAMR. Or maybe you're a three and you're like, oh, I'm just here, you know, to make sure I'm on top of my game and up to date on the latest. Okay. Seeing a lot of ones, a sprinkling of twos and threes. Two, yeah. Beautiful. Okay. This is perfect. Nice snapshot from everyone. Thanks. Now that I've got that, Dave, let's jump to the next one. It gives me an idea of how I want to frame this next piece to you. So for a majority, of the audience, this is going to probably be your first time really taking a look at SAMR. If you weren't aware, SAMR is an acronym, and that acronym is standing for four different levels. The way that they have it set up here, you're going to see almost like blooms, it looks like I start with this foundational and I'm working my way up. In practice, I want to note Dave is going to show you an image of a swimming pool which is how I'm gonna want you to eventually think of navigating this framework, going back and forth between the levels. But for the purpose of introducing it, I'm just gonna go in order. SAMR stands for substitution, augmentation, 
modification and redefinition. There are four tiers and they take those four tiers and they put them into two different buckets. The first two mean that you are using technology either in a classroom or distance learning environment in a way that is enhancing a lesson that you could have done without the technology. The top two tiers are the transformation level. And this isn't just modifying an existing lesson with technology, but it is completely transforming how that lesson is taught, what students are doing, and it would not be possible to do that lesson without the technology. You have completely transformed what it does. Now, I am not just gonna sit and read these definitions to you. To me, it makes more sense to be able to explain it with an example. Before I do that, I wanna align those four different levels with blooms to give you a better idea. So the next slide shows you taking your SAMR model, putting blooms on the, on the side, it'll show you the parallels. So substitution, think of that as students, they're using technology at a level where they're gonna be doing some maybe recalling and kind of like, oh, instead of you know my paper worksheet that at times might be a useful tool, they're gonna do that on the computer now. Augmentation. I gonna have my students, you know, I'm just tweaking the lesson a little bit. They're doing understanding and applying. Modification and redefinition at those higher tiers, they're gonna have students creating. So let me give you the examples. Let's start with substitution. Think of, and I think, you know, I saw there were some math teachers in here, but you can write a paper for math, right? Let's use the example of writing a paper. Before technology, you've got your tools, your paper and your pencil. When you think of SAMR, picture the substitution level as someone saying, student, your task is to write a paper and I am simply gonna swap out your paper and pencil for this Chromebook. I am not going to change the objectives of this lesson in any way. The technology is not going to change the actual verbs or actions that you're doing to complete this assignment. I am simply directly substituting a tool. That is a level of technology usage that would be substitution. When you go to level two, augmentation, you are now going to be modifying something. You're tweaking it a little bit. So now instead of just saying student, I'm directly swapping out tools, you are adding a functional improvement. You might say student, I also now want you to use the internet and I'd like you to find some graphics or maybe I want you to use something like um, a Microsoft Excel or a Google Sheet and I want you to create a graphic and embed it within your paper. That's a functional improvement from just the paper and pencil. So that's what augmentation is. And again, those two levels are within one bucket. Now let's get to the transformational level. This is your level three, think of it as. This is modification. You are now going to significantly redesign the task in some way, and that's going to be because of the technology. So now you might say, student, I'm giving you a new tool. I'm asking you to embed some graphics. In addition, I am going to redesign this task because I will no longer be the sole audience for your paper. Instead, you are going to post this on some type of forum, whether that's, who knows, gonna be like a Google site, a class blog, but you are going to now have your work read by a wide audience. And in doing that, you have just redesigned the task for who the student is writing the paper for, you've given them authentic purpose. So that is not something that that paper that was you know, written on physical paper could have been done before the technology. This is brand new. Finally, you get to the fourth level. And the fourth level of SAMR is redefinition. And this is a task that would have been previously inconceivable without the technology. So now it's student, your assignment, you're still going to write this paper and you're gonna share out your thinking. But in addition, you might now share that thinking instead of just the written word, you might create a multimedia presentation to share out your findings and do this in collaboration with a student 
from a neighboring district without ever having to leave either your house or the classroom. And you're going to share this out to a wide authentic audience online. That is something that that humble paper and pencil, though they still have a place in learning, it could not have facilitated something like that. And that's why we reach that transformational level. So hopefully that example will help give you an idea of these different levels of SAMR. We do have some other examples. I'm gonna pass it over to Dave to walk through them with you because I really think that'll help solidify it. Thanks, Jennifer. So just to take it a little further and show some more examples, um, this is where we see most educators struggle is just figuring out what some of this means. So here's a few more examples um, in two different scenarios here. So one is students are reading a digitized version of a book versus the paper back book. So just substituting digital for analog. Um, but now let's augment it a little and let them do some digital note taking in that digital copy. And there's a wide variety of ways to do that. We're going to go through some of the different options. There's some we'll be sharing where even if it's a simple PDF and they don't have a tool to annotate there. There's other tools and free resources where they can use extensions to annotate over it and take notes. Um, then the next level might be giving them an audiobook. They're taking collaborative notes in Google Docs while listening together uh, through the audiobook all at the same time with uh, Google Meet or a Hangout. So that they're all working together and instead of the teacher reading the book, they're listening to it and taking these notes and providing notes to each other. And then at the redefinition stage, they would then be bringing in either the author of what they read or an expert on that topic via Twitter chat or Hangout or some other format to do um, a chat with them and for them to provide their reactions to it and then have the speaker give them feedback. So it really starts bringing in some stuff that they couldn't do before. And another example looking now at math would be uh, the typical they're doing, you know, math problems on paper, but now we're giving them a, a worksheet. So that's substitution. Um, they're doing a digital worksheet. So really nothing changed except it's not paper. Next step, they're using a math game or app to practice that math. So they're doing something more. It's giving them some feedback. They're learning, did they do it right or not? And they're getting that feedback that way step it up to modification and now they are creating a screencast of themselves explaining how to solve that math problem using images, handwriting on the screen, et cetera. And again, this is all stuff that can be done very easily with technology, but as we all know, when you get to that level of starting to explain something or teach it to somebody else, your understanding of it goes up tremendously as well. And then the next level would be taking it to, they're doing a screencast with digital inking, um, full explanations, maybe pulling in other resources, then uploading it to a classroom YouTube channel or another uh, resource where then the entire class would be able to um, see it and learn from it and provide feedback on it. So really stepping up the game. And when you look at these two sets of examples, you start realizing those modification and redefinition levels of both is where most, most people have to get to in their work for what they're creating for their jobs anyway. So it's starting to build those career skills as well. Um, now, Jennifer mentioned the swimming pool. So the swimming pool is a visual example of some of the stuff with SAMR. So typically everybody can be working on that substitution level. Um, you can then go a little deeper and start getting some more augmentation but then every once in a while, you start digging down into the modification and really deep to redefinition. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be doing all of this all the time. There's plenty of times that that substitution level is exactly what's needed to get students to build some of those base skills, get that base knowledge, and then you start scaffolding from there to get them to where they can start doing the next levels. And also for the teacher to start working on, well, how do I then take this and augment it or bring it all the way to redefinition? And you're not going to do that with every lesson you have. There's so many things that have to do. And you go back and forth throughout this as you're working with your students and your curriculum. You're not just staying in one spot. Um, there's tons of supports. 
So they like to talk about it, uh, flotation devices, but you have leadership coaches, professional development, personal learning networks, all of that can, can help along with some of the resources that you'll be getting from here that help you kind of look at what you're doing now and how do you expand that to the next level. Um, and then, so what we wanted to focus on today was some of the digital tools that are out there that can help you get to those higher levels of modification and redefinition. And this is just going to be a very small group due to t of uh, tools due to timing, but there'll be some additional ones and the resources that you'll be able to dig through on your own when you get the slide deck. And of course, as time goes on, if you have any questions, you can reply to us. Uh, through here and we can get you more resources as well. So with that, we'll turn this back to Jennifer to get us kicked off on the tools part. Awesome, perfect. Okay, wanna start off right away, Dave, if you can jump to the next slide. This is super important. And my friends in IT, they would be like, Jennifer, did you show this to everybody if you're gonna be suggesting tools? So just a note, if you see something and you think, oh my gosh, this could definitely play a role for my students in my classroom, make sure that you are running this by somebody in the IT department just to make sure that it's complying with any you know, regulations that they might have, make sure that it fits in. I always encourage open communication you know, between the teachers, between the IT department, makes things flow smoothly. So if you want to play with it, you know, on your own, go for it on your personal computer, but always double check with IT before starting something new. So that's my disclaimer out there. With that being said, let's jump right in. You might say right away, Google Slides, Jennifer, I thought, I thought we were going to be seeing some new tools today. Maybe you're like, I already use Google Slides. How on earth? is something that's a basic presentation builder when you get my students to these higher level thinking skills and creation capabilities. I'm telling you right now, Google Slides is one of the most underutilized tools, in my opinion, in G Suite for Education because it is so much more than a presentation builder. Really, when you use Google Slides, that right there is the ultimate blank canvas for students to really build out and share their learning in ways you might not have thought of before. For example, this can be used as an animation tool. Again, if you see something hyperlinked in here, it's because when you get the deck, I want you to dive in deep into it and dig into it for yourself. Students are able to use slides to show a story. Think of it almost like stop motion, where for each slide in Google Slides, they're moving the images just enough that if they click through in presentation mode, it creates an actual animation and they can build out presentations that way. In that sense, it almost becomes a form of art rather than just your basic you know, PowerPoint slide deck. They can also, if you've heard the term before, app smash, that means when you're using multiple apps to create something, they can app smash this with something called Screencastify. Screencastify that you're gonna learn about later today is a screen recorder. And so while the student goes through and clicks and their animation comes to life, they can be recording and they've just now created a video. What a fantastic way to give students a new way to express their thinking and their learning. One thing I want to call out before I give another example, if you look in the top right, you're going to see a little icon and it's going to show a money symbol and an X. So we are marking for you for any tool that we show, whether it is free, so not paid, so Google Slides is free, that's why it has the X, or if it's going to be a paid version, something you need to subscribe to. In that case, it will have a little check. Some tools will have the option to have a free version or you could upgrade. In that case, we'll put both. But back to what Google Slides can do. Another thing that I want everybody to think about is this awesome capability for something called branching. And branching in Google Slides is where you can put on a slide a text box or an image and you can link that object, the text or image, and link it to another slide in the deck that's not directly after it. So that way students are now able to answer questions 
or put together like a choose your own adventure. And based on the button they click, it will take them to a different place in the slide deck. So you have just now created this interactive platform for them that they can move around in. That can be used either as a teacher for giving a lesson or it can be used by the student for creating something. For example, like a choose your own adventure type of story, which is something totally awesome. So definitely invite you to dig deeper into this. But once they have that actual Google slide created, we wanna make sure we're giving them an authentic place that they can share out their work. And for that, I'm gonna pass it to Dave. He's gonna to touch on where are they gonna put something awesome like a Google slide deck that they made that's interactive. So thanks, Jennifer. Um, so another tool built into G Suite is Google Sites. And while we see a lot of teachers creating a class website to post materials and resources for students, we don't often see students using it as much as they can. Um, so there's plenty of ways to keep it private if that's something that needs to be done. There's also ways to allow them to share it externally to get an authentic audience. Um, but they can do a lot on a Google site. Uh, especially the newer version from the last couple of years, much easier to use, uh, very user friendly. And one of the things they can do is start posting materials there, create a digital portfolio of their work for all their classes, um, but also start inserting other things and putting all these other things they could build in there. So they can create information, they can create videos, they can create these different app smashes, which um, our colleague Joe Marquez has a, a huge variety of things that he app smashes all using sites and slides, um, an e-binder for all their materials. But this is a place where they can put all these resources, they can create it as a resource itself or post their other ones. Um, one of the things I had done when I was in the classroom was had my students um, pick how they wanted to showcase their learning of Newton's three laws. And what a lot of students chose was to create an informational website on it. So they would create the website, they would put in all the materials, they would lay it out as if it was an educational platform where they were, you know, students, other students would go here to learn about those topics. So that is one way they can use it, along with a repository for their materials. And then depending on how they're creating it, how you want to use it in the class, you can have them then share it externally and bring in outside people to take a look at it give them feedback on it, um, use it as a platform to discuss different topics. Uh, so instead of a static document or a slide deck, they can start putting a lot of different features into the site itself. And Jennifer had mentioned before that we had a tool, nice tool for creating some of these things and Screencastify is that tool. Uh, it is very simple, easy to use screen recording application. Uh, you can install it as an extension in Chrome. Um, it lets you take and record everything you're doing. So it's going to record your screen. It's going to record the audio so you can narrate and capture everything that you're doing in there. Um, you have a lot of different resources to learn it. But then once you've gotten the basics, besides using it as a teaching tool where you're creating these tutorials and uh, resources for your students, or even using it while you're teaching remotely to record what you're doing for students who maybe couldn't make the live version, is then let the students use it. So they can create their own instructional videos. Uh, we had mentioned one of the subs, uh, augmentation and modifications uh, start leading up to them creating videos. This is one way of doing it. But imagine a student taking Google Slides and creating this wonderful slide deck with multimedia um, resources in it with all these different kinds of links and connections and then create putting that up on their computer walking through it and talking and recording the whole thing and using that as their assignment and showing that they know not only the topic but know how to use some of these digital tools and really think creatively um, so they can use it to explain their understanding they can use it to create materials for themselves uh, they can practice fluency so that's one thing we see a lot of his students using it to record what they're doing to solve a problem, what they're doing to read, what they're doing to learn a new language. So the teacher can not just see the final output, but actually see their methods and provide them a lot of feedback. Um, that method where they're recording what they're doing, they can then play back 
and it gives them some of that metacognition and some of the feedback on, oh, that's what I was thinking when I did that. Why didn't it work properly? And then go ahead and um, learn from that. Very simple to use. There's a free version and a paid enterprise version. Uh, it depends on really the needs of the user. Um, like anything, if it's a freemium model, the free one has some limitations in terms of the length of recordings, but it's still a very useful tool for students. So with that, we're gonna throw it back to Jennifer for another kind of tool that can do some uh, recording and much more. Okay, I will say if you are a teacher on some type of committee that's going to be considering apps that you think would benefit a wide range of grade levels across subject areas, my personal recommendation that I would give to you that I used when I was teaching and that I've seen used across K through 12 now in this role is explain everything. Explain everything is the ultimate interactive whiteboard. I have yet to find one, whether that be, you know, your Microsoft whiteboard, Jamboard, out of all the ones that are out there, explain everything I have seen is the one that has the most tools that can really do it all. So what explain everything is, if you're not quite sure when I say interactive whiteboard, what that means, think of it as a blank white canvas. If you look at the first GIF or GIF, depending on the camp that you're in, you'll see that there's a toolbar on the side. And those are the different things that the student can do within the whiteboard. That's gonna include telling some type of story and that might be a map story, that might be a story with images, that could be a story with text, that could be a video. It could be all of those things combined into one on an infinite canvas. Infinite canvas means you can take this whiteboard, pretend I have like a screen right here, I can shrink it, it, is, it has no borders. It can keep going infinitely in all directions. So they're able to put their thinking there. In addition, they can record their voice. They don't need to use another app. This is all within the same app. So they can record their voice they can screen record what they're doing while they're writing or taking images or annotating over pictures. They can record that in real time. They can also shoot a video and embed that video within the actual whiteboard itself. They can collaborate with their peers. So you can have multiple students working in a whiteboard. This is something I personally did for guided reading groups. I would take a picture, maybe of a page of text, have them break out. I'd want them to annotate on it. And you can also, instead of just having the one whiteboard slide, you could add additional slides. So in essence, it can become almost like a book. This whole creation you have, and if you jump to the next slide, it's gonna give you even more information. Once they have created this product, they can export it in a variety of ways, which I love. And you can export it easily to different places, to a Google Drive, to a Dropbox, as an actual file to the computer itself. It can be in the form of a PDF. It can be in the form of video. It could be in the form of an explain everything file. So someone can open it up and edit it within the same app. It just, to me, they've thought of everything. So I've given some ideas how I used it as a teacher to create things to teach and how my students used it to show their learning. So it really is a tool that can be used on both sides of the teacher's desk. So it was something that I would use, especially in a distance learning environment like this, now that I think of how I could apply it, it was how I'd be able to introduce a lesson how I'd be able to show myself completing a problem, giving a tutorial. It was a way for me to create things like graphic organizers and push them out for students to be able to work on and they could then send them back. Or I could give students a little more freedom and creativity instead of sending them a template, I could just give them the lesson and give them the blank template, just totally the whiteboard and they could just start from scratch themselves. I used it for journals and science, so that way they could take pictures when we did plants and we could show the progress that way instead of just having to draw it out, which we could if we wanted to draw it, it has drawing tools, 
but it was nice to be able to have that option. So this is one I would absolutely dig into if you have that capability. And just want to throw out there, by the way, if anyone has any questions about any of these tools or things we're sharing, feel free to utilize that group chat. We are absolutely open to Q&A, so just want to throw it out. I know that everybody's kind of following along, but we are happy to answer any questions that you have. And I'm going to give it back to Diana because she's going to go into a very, very cool one that I did not know about till she taught me. So we do have a question um, from Michael in the chat is explain everything compatible with Google Classroom, Jennifer. Yes. So as far as being compatible with Google Classroom, I was able to post and explain everything file into Google Classroom as an assignment for the students. So that way they could download it when they would upload their assignment at the end, it would upload to Google Drive and that's how they'd be able to access it for them to send it to me through Classroom, so yes. Uh, and how about Canvas? Is it compatible with Canvas? Yep, you can just upload it as, a, as an explain everything file or as a PDF so it can be pushed out through an LMS like Canvas. Great, so thanks for the questions, uh, Christine and Michael. And um, you know, just as Jennifer said, keep popping in any questions for us. Uh, so yes, ThingLink is one of my favorites. It's kind of a, a little bit of a sleeper, but it's extremely easy to learn how to use. And if you think of it, it's almost like a bulletin board, which can then be 360 degrees if you choose to use it that way. So there are two versions. One is um, the free, and then you, you have the uh, paid version. Um, with the free version, as a teacher or as students, you can create um, these interactive uh, boards um, with, and include images, videos, audio, but also 360 degree media. So one of the things I really enjoy about that is we're thinking about moving into the future and what skills are we helping the students build uh, so that we can, you know, be prepared for the future. And so much is coming around that immersive kind of experience. So they can, you know, grab Google Classroom or Google uh, 360 images or anything that exists out there can be added in. Also, if students are um, have any access to uh, GoPros or anything simple and low, you know, budget kind of things, they can create their own 360 and, and put it in. There's a lot of free apps out there. So it's easy to learn, and then it's also responsive. So it can be viewed on a, any mobile device, on desktops, big screen TVs, and then also on virtual reality headsets. Um, a lot of teachers have used it in very creative different ways. And again, think back to those skills. Um, so that creativity is really high up on top there. If uh, we think about SAMR, a substitution, as I said, is just creating a bulletin board. Um, I've seen a, a teacher use it as a porch concert. So because schools were closed down, spring concerts were canceled. So instead, students in this uh, district went out into their front porch on the same night at the same time and played their favorite songs, the songs that would be in the concert. And you can post, some students posted photos, some posted the video. Um, another way is I've seen teachers use it is a virtual tour of historic sites. So they've brought in these, these 360 degree photos and they narrate it so they can put in the audio. Students collaborate um, over you know, different time zones or within, you know, they don't have to be in the same place. Uh, in that try it as, do feel free. And yes, Jennifer, I see, oh, Jennifer's telling you, Kate, yeah, there will be, um, you'll have these shared out. All these links will be live for you. So take a look at how some students and teachers in Italy used it. You'll have to listen to a little bit of Italian, um, but really creative ways of, of um, exploring the world around them. So great questions coming in. And next, uh, we're gonna talk about Adobe Spark. Awesome. So wanted to make sure that everybody was able to get as many free tools um, as possible. Um, I know there's amazing paid ones out there, but sometimes there's, it's just good to have a repertoire of ones you know that you're not going to have to pay for. And in that case, I would absolutely point people towards Adobe Spark. So when you think about Adobe Spark, this is something that can be used for video storytelling. 
It is a free app. It creates, as far as a free app goes, some of the highest quality presentations I've seen because it's coming from Adobe. So you know the images they're giving you to work with are going to be quality. And there are different ways that it can be used. So you have Spark Post, which is a way that students can create graphics. So you can see out of these three images, if you look at the one that has a background with an umbrella, and you students are able to create either like a meme or some type of inspirational quote. Those are common ways I've seen it used. But really, it's having our students be able to express their thinking in a brand new way. And doing that with a graphic, that is something incredibly powerful because they're going to have to be able to explain the imagery behind it why they chose it, and then of course they're going to have to find some type of meaningful text, however you want to use that in the classroom, and that can go across subject areas. So that's Spark Post. You also have Spark Page, which is, and when you get this um, slide deck, make sure that you actually click, click these links. So if you look at the bottom of this slide where the wolves are, it'll take you to a Spark Wolves presentation that was put together by a student. And it's a beautiful way that they captured their research that they did about wolves. And again, it's a new way for them to be able to express their thinking. And it gives that authentic audience opportunity because now, it's not just on a poster that only one person who's right in front of it can see. That can be pushed out and shared with their class and their peers online. If you go to the next page, it's going to give additional examples. So if you click through Adobe Spark and EDU when you get this, it's going to show different ways that you can create this video storytelling in your classroom. And this can, again, have students do this to give thinking summaries. They can make mini documentaries. I personally, when I did fifth grade for a few years, I had them create their about me videos that way at the beginning of the year. Because when we're thinking about a distance learning environment or even in the classroom, it's not just hitting standards, it's building community. And it's nice if you can use different tools Play, see, you know, which do you maybe, which does your class like more than the other, which is more popular. You'll be surprised. It'll change year to year. Um, so you're going to notice that some of these tools might overlap in their capabilities with other ones. And it's just kind of testing the waters to see what it is that you like. But there is so much that you can do with the Adobe Spark family. And again, it's free, which I love. So definitely want to point that out. I see that there are some questions in the chat, so I'm just taking a peek. One was, does Explain Everything have a lot more features than Jamboard? I'm new to both. So yes, Explain Everything does have more features than Jamboard. So for example, that ability for students to be able to record their work in real time, that's something that's built into Explain Everything, whereas for Jamboard, you would have to use a different app so you could try and download, let's say, Screencastify, and for Jamboard, the student could record what they're doing using Screencastify. That would be an additional extension, and they'd be limited to a five-minute recording if they were using the free version. For Explain Everything, it would be unlimited, um, so just something for you to be able to note there. Um, but they're definitely, I definitely recommend clicking through some of the links. It can do a lot more. What I will say, though, is, that's if you are fortunate enough to have access to explain everything. If you are in a place where, no, your school or district is not going to be buying a subscription, then look at Jamboard. By no means am I saying to ignore any of the other apps. Use what you can. It's a good question. How are these different or better than Google Slides and Sites? I would not use the term better. I like the term different because I think that there are similar things they can do. They're both platforms for students to share out information. Google Slides, students have a lot more ability to customize because it's a blank canvas. So students are really able to work and drag in the text and video, whereas Adobe Spark, it's a bit more guided and structured and the template's already set and they're pulling from a set base library of images and things like that. Sites, I would say they could also customize further. Adobe Spark, 
I think sometimes it might look a little cleaner, a little more professional, uh, just depending on, you know, the level of the student for using it. That's a good question. And I, th and I think you make a good point there, Jennifer. You're like, it's going back and forth. It's not about which might, um, you know, be better. But um, one of those skill sets is cognitive flexibility. So how will students use a different format? Um, you know, if you have access to multiple different types of uh, resources, digital tools, allow the students, give them choice. Which one of these tools would you want to use? How would you apply each of these or which do you feel would be best? And that's giving them a little bit of student agency as well. Absolutely. Uh, there was a, another question about how would you use it in science? And A. Thompson, um, let me know if I'm off the mark here, but I think you were, uh, you post that after the thing link um, and it would be a, for an interactive type of um, science lab so either the science reports students could record video they can post photographs they, there is a function for putting text in it's not uh, the most robust but also if you wanted to um, have you know, post a lab for some schools that are not as highly resourced with um, different science uh, lab materials some of it could be digital if you needed to post an augmented reality version. Um, you know, some resources there. It's a nice way to collect it all together. So I know we're running a little short on time, Jennifer. Sure, um, Dave, if you want to skip through just so people can see the additional apps we will not talk about but that are available for you after you get this presentation. It will cover Flipgrid. We can keep going. It's going to talk about Seesaw, which is a great collaborative platform for students to share and post. There is information about Squid as well, which is a fabulous annotation tool. And if we keep on moving through, we talk a little bit about video editing. This is especially if you are not using um, iMovie. This is a great alternative, particularly for Chromebooks. If we pass through, there might be, I think, a couple more that we had that you'll want to dig in on your own because I know we're coming up on time. That would be Book Creator, which is another just great creation app, and Padlet, which used to be free tier. Now, eventually, you do. After you make, I think it's like three Padlets, you have to get a subscription. It's so good, though. So definitely check this one out, and we can skip to the next. I want to make sure we have time at the end. We're going to just cover very quickly some tips for managing some of this, you know, tech usage and project-based learning. Um, starting off with planning out your lessons and projects. Whenever you're going to tackle any of these, I always say, and we know this as teachers, right, but it's good to hear again. Start with the standards. Start with what it is that you need students to learn. Think of what you want them to do and then pick the tool. I don't recommend starting with the tool and just trying to squeeze and jam it into a lesson that might not make sense. So educate yourself on the tools that are out there. Think of the lesson that you have and then find that way to blend them together. Since you're probably going to be using different tools, it's nice to have a central hub for students to turn their work in. That might be Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams, which thank you, Barb, in the chat, you know, she shouts out, some of these tools, they might be more Microsoft based. Some might, you know, be geared more towards the Chromebook. You're going to want to educate yourself on that. We've given you links to do so. But find that central hub that's going to work as a place for assignments to live. Um, and yes, this slide deck will be shared, Christine. Definitely stay organized with a calendar, reminders, give students explicit instruction. If you jump to the next slide, we've got just a couple more. And again, as teachers, we know these, but it's good to hear them. Thinking of having ongoing support and resources for students when they're using the tools. If you can, you know, depending on grade level, have video tutorials for them so that they can go back to if they need to just double check how to do something, empower them to figure out how to use the app on their own give them choice and agency. It's always great if you can give more than one suggestion for students for a tool. Let them find what works best for them. Um, and always aligning with our curriculum and our standards. Look at this, Diana and Dave, we're keeping on time. I love it. And one last thing about those standards, since I know there's some ISTE training going on, you know, even the, in addition to the content standards, be looking at those ISTE standards and, and start filling or start applying some of those when you start to design your classes. 
if you right now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm the type of person I keep my phone by me. If you want to take a picture of this link because you're so eager that you want to check out this deck right now, that's <laughs> the link to the deck. It will also be emailed. But if you are just read, ready and raring to go, there's your link. Snap a picture, cdwgets.it slash idea sammer. And we do have, if we skip the slide, I know we have some other webinar Wednesdays coming up, so we will move ahead. The link was thrown in the chat for you to click directly as well. So Dave, if you want to jump so we can show some of those upcoming webinar Wednesdays. Oh, wait. You guys will see there's a resource slide too. We didn't leave you hanging. There's even more. So check that out. But I do want to show the webinar Wednesday slides. So here's Fantastic. what we have. Fantastic. Yep, Jenna. Awesome. That was so good. Thank you so much, guys. I, I mean, so full and robust. Clearly, we didn't even have enough time for it all. Um, I did want to say, and I put in the chat, that um, some of those tools that you guys mentioned, we actually have also done webinars on. So if you're unfamiliar with the tool, go look at our Wednesday webinar um, webpage. I put the link in a few times in the chat, and you can watch some of the webinars that we've done with some of those um, groups as well. So definitely um, good resources there. Uh, just wanted to mention some additional webinars that we have coming up with IDEA. Our webinars are always free and you get PDHs, so it's awesome to come join us. Um, later this afternoon at 3 o'clock, we're working with the Illinois Principals Association on educating with intention, integrating social emotional learning. So um, you can go to our um, website at ideaillinois.org slash calendar and you'll find that there and it'll take you to the registration link so that you get the Zoom link and everything there. And then the next one, Dave, I think I got one more in there. Um, on June 24th, we are hooking up with Lego um, Education and going to be doing a computer science unplug. So this is a hands-on one. You're going to bring your bricks, so bring some Legos with you. And um, we're going to do some activities showing how you can teach computer science even remotely um, where the kids are still hands-on. So lots of great activities in there. Again, ideaillinois.org slash calendar for that as well. Um, I am going to paste into the um, chat window right now. I know people are asking about it. Here is your link for your PDH. And then I'm also putting that calendar link in there as well. So if you simply click that um, bit.ly for the PDH, it's going to take you to a Google form, a little bit of information, and then it's going to send you your evidence of completion. Um, so definitely go ahead and fill that one out. It's going to be open till midnight tonight. So click it now, get it done, get it out of the way. Um, it'll be open till midnight tonight um, because, again, we do um, only provide that credit for live attendance of the webinars. Um, that's an ISBE thing. So uh, if you have any other questions, please go ahead and throw them in the chat window right now. Jennifer, Diana, Dave, and I will stick around for another minute or two. I know we uh, went over a minute or two, but you guys, thank you so much. Um, fantastic. I, I'm a big SAMR person, so I do love this. So it was, uh, I, I even love that I explain it the same way you guys do when I explain it. So I feel like I've been vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not vindicated, but uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Validated. Validated. Yeah. validated. That's the word. <laughs> but you don't need validation. It's, it's Samer's having another resurgence, and it's wonderful. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. So thank you so much. Um, again, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Otherwise, I will send out the recording and the resources and everything for this tomorrow. So keep an eye out on your uh, email for that as well. So thanks so much. I'm talking to myself. Um, Dave, <laughs> Dave, you may need to give me back host um, so that
and you can cut out whenever because I think since you're host when you cut out it'll kill the whole thing so if you give it back to me then uh you guys can take off whenever and I can hang out um, but it seems like people are cutting out pretty quickly so thanks so much for setting that up and having us thank it was you that yes. was great we had a good audience too oh yeah thank yeah. you everyone thanks for participating in good questions Great questions, very engaged. Jennifer, you sent me the link to the presentation, correct? Yes. Okay, so um, unless there's anything else, I'll just use that link, I'll add the chat, um, I'll do the chat file, add the chat file to it. Um, and then, like I said, edit out all the before and post stuff and, um, get that out tomorrow then so perfect very Great. nice to meet well, you you Bye. too thank you so much yes. everybody hopefully we'll uh do something again so let us know if you guys have anything else you want to collaborate on and um present and that would be awesome so we appreciate it thank you for thank you for your continued partnership oh absolutely well, happy to do so. Great. Okay. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone thank you bye guys um. Looking for how to give you back presenter. You know what? If you just, I think we're good. If you just cut out one, then um, I think we're good. All right. Have a good so, one then. Thanks, Dave. Bye bye.